Hello everyone, Loremaster of Sotek here to basically usher in the last video that I'm going to be making on the Chaos Dwarfs where there are a couple of small little things that came up during the series where maybe there was a question I wasn't able to answer to my satisfaction and thanks to some people in the comment sections I was able to either get those answers from their comments or get an idea of where I needed to go in order to find some more information and uh, answer those questions more to my satisfaction. So that's what this episode is. Uh, this is what I'm basically calling the bonus episode and it is basically just me going back through four questions that I was not happy with the amount of information I provided based on later information that became available to me. So for two of these, I actually got some really interesting and insightful comments that I'm just going to read verbatim to you guys uh, because I don't think there's really anything I can add to it and the commenters did a really good job writing them up. And then I also am going to talk about two questions that some people noted, you know, that there was more information available and I went ahead and looked it up myself and wrote out the answers. So without further ado, let's go ahead and start with the questions that are basically just comments that I'm going to be reading verbatim. Uh, the first is that we had a question back during the Chaos Dwarf, I think, meta and design where people, and this is a common question in fantasy because of its uh, core concept of fantasy, which is that many of the fantasy races, uh, not all of them, but many of them, are based on historical ideals or civilizations or cities or cultures or whatever. And that includes the Chaos Dwarfs. The Chaos Dwarfs are one of the races that are based on certain cities, cultures, and histories of a particular set of civilizations. And people wanted to know what it was. And I kind of was able to, like, ballpark Mesopotamian um, uh, ideology. Like, it, it's based on a Mesopotamian theme and idea, but I wasn't really able to give satisfactory specifics. And there was a really nice comment from Eric the Red, who actually left comments in most of the videos, that I would really encourage reading his comments, because you can learn a lot of interesting things about the history of the Chaos Dwarfs as far as their design philosophy goes. I don't think that I need to go over all of his questions. This is the only one um, that I'm reading from him verbatim. I think for most of them, they're information that's interesting, but it's not what I consider to be relevant to the time and the world of Warhammer Fantasy that I focus on in my channel. Uh, that being said, I do want to really... Before I read this guy's comment, I think, if memory serves, that he is associated with the Chaos Dwarf community that you can find um, online. Um, they have a set of forums, and there's even a podcast associated with their community. Um, they, I only kind of learned about them during the end of the Q&A series, uh, towards the end of it, but, um, I have watched some of their stuff and it's really, really interesting. I think if you have any interest, like even the tiniest interest in Chaos Dwarfs, then you are doing yourself a massive disservice by at least not checking out their podcast which the, the episodes are very long, they have really interesting guests on, they talk about everything related to Chaos Dwarfs from models to design to painting to lore to gameplay and I think they're going to be an interesting community to be watching especially as we get closer to seeing Chaos Dwarfs brought to life in Total War Warhammer. Um, I will have links in the uh, the posted comment, pin comment, there we go, the pin comment and the description to their podcasts and to their forums. So if you like the Chaos Dwarfs, then this is a community that I really think you should definitely check out. Um, and then uh, there's some other stuff we'll talk about later, but let's go ahead and read uh, the comment relating to what the Chaos Dwarfs are based off historically uh, and Eric the Red's kind uh, the way he expanded on this because I think it's actually super interesting and these are things that I would know nothing about. Um, 
Uh, granted, once again, I'm not a historical person, so and history I find is one of those things where it seems like understanding history is a very subjective experience, not an objective experience. So if any of this you're kind of like, well, that's not how I see history, well, then maybe you could, uh, I'll also link to where these comments are. Maybe you can, you know, engage in a friendly discussion, but keep it friendly. I'll be watching you guys. Anyway, let's go ahead and read what he has to say. So this is what he has to say in regards to what real world histories and cultures the Chaos Dwarfs design was taken from. Eric the Red says, Mesopotamia is the easiest answer, as it includes all the true answers. Though if we break it down, it's Assyrian, Babylonian, and Persian. Their politics are based off the Assyrians, which apparently these guys, according to what historical records we have, their first empire, quote-unquote, was an extremely cruel place and nobody liked them. And the empires of the known world at that time apparently or supposedly united to crush these guys and to bring them crumbling down which does bear a lot of similarities to the way the Chaos Dwarfs act and how people view them. Their nation is based off Babylon, with the ziggurats, their fighting style, uh, you know, the various ways the Chaos Dwarfs engage in combat. And then lastly, their religion is a very twisted version of the real-world religion of Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism, there we go. A Persian religion. Granted, let me reiterate that he said a twisted version, so obviously it's not a one-to-one. -one. Um, and please don't take offense to that. A bit of a runoff is that the Chaos Dwarf capital is very much based on Babylon. Check a map and then check the Darklands map. Mingulzar Nagrund has the Falls of Doom to the north, which turns into the River Ruin that flows through their capital as we've discussed. And they use this to house the massive, uh, the mass bulk of their navy inside their capital. They also use this to cool their forges as well as brew their beer. Now, what did Babylon have that was famous that they redirected a river for? The Hanging Gardens of Babylon. So how cool would it be when you're fighting your way through the three layers of the ziggurat that is Mingozar Nagrand, and at the top of it you find a paradise, not a hellhole like most of us would imagine, but something on the same level as we've seen with the High Elves. And there on the sides of this top layer that lead into the highest temple of Hashit is an overflowing and clean canal directed straight from the river Ruin. So, I thought that was a really interesting thing. Uh, I like the idea of there being a hanging garden of uh, Hashit. And personally, I, I do agree with him that it would be really interesting and um, would, would be a clever way to have a shocking difference in style um, if when you got to the top level of the ziggurat for Mengozar Nagron, you found like a Garden of Eden type situation um, to kind of allude to that Babylonian uh, history or myth. Um, our next comment comes from commenter Pizzy Frizo, and his actually regards the Chaos Dwarfs in Age of Sigmar, which, uh, like I said, they have appeared quite a bit, and I've talked about that extensively, and we know that they're coming in, probably in 3rd edition, uh, hopefully in 3rd edition, but they're coming soon, relatively speaking. And one of the things um, that he commented is something I actually did not know, which is that there is a direct reference to Hashit, or something that claims to be Hashit, and also maybe one of his early servants. So let's uh, read kind of the um, comment he left here, which is from the June 2019 article of White Dwarf that published a Tome Celestial, which Tome Celestial are like focused lore and rules tidbits about particular sub-factions within the playable races of AOS. And this one was on the Volstark Lodge, which is a Fire Slayer sub-faction. So it says, It's a sidebar, uh, this Tome Celestial, that gives away the biggest hint so far as to the origins of the Chaos Dwarves in Age of Sigmar. So it says, When the Voss Forge, which is the ancestral home of the Vostarg, and generally of uh, Grimnir's cult deep within the Salamander Spine Mountain Range, was broken by chaos during the Age of Chaos, 
The twelve sons of the late rune father, Thorgar Grimnir, departed to find, found their own lodges. Only Zafor, the father of victories, retained the same uh, retained the name of Volstarg, and his descendants found their new home of Furios Peak later. Zaphor himself, his life, and his death are extremely mysterious, even to the Fire Slayers themselves. The Twelve Sons of Thorgar Grimnir is the sidebar that then is then added. The Battlesmith chroniclers of the Volstarg hotly debate the fates of Zaphor's eleven brothers. It is known that the eldest, Bromholf, stubbornly swore to defend the Vosforge and was cut down during the fall of the Magma Hold. Many, though the exact number is much contested by those claiming to descend from the Vostarg, founded their own lodges, such as Beldrag, and went on to win great renown. Others took the oath of the Grimnim, or even the Doomseeker, wandering the realms until new purpose or a worthy death claimed them. Only one attempted to reclaim the Vosforge. Of the fate of Dars, Thorgar's youngest son, less is known even than that of Zaphor. This silence would imply he did not succeed. Yet those who braved the dangers of the Salamander's spine in search of the first forge's treasures occasionally chance upon strange metal obelisks and isolated leering battle forges. These totems emanate a fell power, glowing with an unwholesome inner light. Upon their flanks are carved dwarden runes that offer praise to the Father of Darkness and his first unnamed prophet. So there you go. It could. This does seem to cement that Hashet himself has survived into Age of Sigmar, and we. It seems that he has a uh, a prophet somewhere. I uh, still am really excited to see what they're going to do with the Chaos Dwarves in AOS 3rd uh, Edition. I'm really curious if it's going to turn out Hashet somehow snuck his way onto the Dwarf Pantheon, where he was able to betray Grimnir and Grugni, or if maybe his first unnamed prophet that they mentioned was one of the Dwarven Pantheon, which is what led to Grimnir and Grugni being chained up on the highest mountain in Shaman during the Age of Myth, waiting for Sigmar to come free them. Because it's worth noting that when this story takes place, this uh, this young son, Dars, who seems to become a Chaos Dwarf in order to reclaim his ancestral home or something along those lines, that that happens, that whole situation happens during the Age of Chaos, which is many, 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 many years later, eons later, you could even say. But, uh, yeah, so that's the two direct comments I'm going to read. And now there are two things I want to expand upon from prior episodes that I did my own research for. So the first is that when we spoke about potential units for the Chaos Dwarfs when they would arrive in Total War Warhammer 3, so looking at anything, anything that's mentioned anywhere that could be added to their lore, um, there, were, there was one main unit... I did not mention that was brought up that I think I should talk about. And that was a group known as Herodens or Viragos, which both basically mean the same thing. They kind of mean like old, unpleasant women, um, which is basically what they are. These are Drathzar women who are past the age where it's possible for them to bear children. And in the Wolfric novel by C.L. Werner, these dwarves have their tongues burned out, it seems, their heads are shaven, so they're bald, and they functionally act as fanatical acolytes of Hashet that guard some individual of note. In the case of the novel, they're guarding the Thane of the um, place that Wolfric is attacking and the guy he's really trying to kill. I think his name's Kananak or something. But they operate very similar to Empire fanatics in that they're frenzied, unarmored combatants who throw themselves into battle with no concept of self-preservation. In the novel, they wield heavy hammers to pulverize enemies who don't dodge aside in time. So maybe they could be something kind of like an unbreakable fanatic unit that has very little, if any, armor, and they just have like an assortment of weapons. You know, if you give them big heavy hammers, they could be armor piercing or maybe they could have kind of an assort assortment of weapons in which case but you could just have them like super high melee attack 
decent damage, they're unbreakable, frenzy, and you can just maybe throw them into battle. Um, that being said, I, I wouldn't expect that there's like a ton of them, um, especially because they're an all-women unit, but they're only once they're past the age of bearing children. Um, whether or not they'd want to go with them, I don't know. Um, they, 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 feel a, they feel an interesting design. Um, but especially, and they, it does make complete sense with Chaos Dwarfs being an even more patriarchal society than regular dwarfs. Um, like Chaos Dwarfs, the priesthood of Hashit is exclusively male. And Hashit seems to, for whatever reason, only favor male servants. Whereas the dwarves are a little bit more egalitarian. Uh, as far as, like, there are really famous queens, and if a king dies, it's possible for his queen to take over, and it has happened before, and stuff like that. So, um, but that is certainly possible for a unit, and that's actually another thing that, uh, that, that, rem being reminded of that unit's existence was another thing brought up by Eric the Red. Um, which reminds me, one thing that I did want to say is that if you have any interest in Chaos Dwarfs, like, you love the Chaos Dwarfs, you, and you want to be able to, like, read about them for yourself, but you're like, man, Tarmacon is, like, a billion dollars if you can even find it, um, which I totally understand. Um, or even the ca old Chaos Dwarf army books can be incredibly difficult to find and very expensive. Um, the easiest way to learn about Chaos Dwarfs is actually through the Wolfric novel. The Wolfric novel has about a third, maybe a quarter of the book, purely dedicated to to fighting Chaos Dwarfs and has a ton of features on them um, by C.L. Werner, uh, who's a fantastic author. My only critiques of this book are that there are some things he does that don't work in the lore of the Chaos Dwarfs, but you could, and like I, I could definitely see the argument being that maybe it's just the place that Wolfric ends up at has these particular weird things to them. Um, probably the biggest things that stood out to me were that there are Black Orc slaves, uh, which is very strange as far as I'm concerned. Like, no Chaos Dwarf in their right mind would ever have Black Orc slaves after the Black Orc Rebellion. Um, but this guy does, and it leads to a rebellion. So, uh, it could be that maybe the, the character in this book is just so arrogant that he thought he could handle Black Orcs, um, despite the fact that I'm pretty sure the Chaos Dwarf Empire, if they had found out he was doing that, would not have been thrilled with him. But um, he is it is a character in an outpost in a settlement that C.L. Warner just kind of makes up and creates. Um, so he can tell the story. But it is super fun, and it's a great way to learn about Chaos Dwarfs and get some really cool ideas. And the main baddie, uh, not only do you get to see a sorcerer um, riding on a Lamasu, which is really cool, it makes for a fun fight... Um, but you also get to see um, a Thane who's wearing a mechanical bodysuit, which I suspect will be very heavily uh, influential on some of the stuff we may see possible with um, Astrogoth Ironhand, uh, who also wears a big mechanical super suit. But I, though I think... Astrogoth Iron Hands is going to be vastly superior to the Thanes in this book. Um, but I would really recommend it. Um, if, if you're really, if what you want is to learn about Chaos Dwarfs and get to see them in a cool book, you can't go wrong with picking up Wolfric. Um, if you can't find Wolfric individually, you can find a fairly recent omnibus that was printed. It's part of the Warhammer Chronicles. Um, which you can usually find on the Black Library website or on Games Workshop's website under the Black Library tab or on Amazon or maybe even your local bookstore. You can ask them. Sometimes they'll have them. I know Barnes & Noble does. Um, you can pick up an omnibus, which is called... I think it's called Champions of the Chaos Waste. Um, it's not Champions of Chaos. There, there's two chronicles that are Omnibi that are very similar, but they have completely different books. There's one which is Champions of Chaos. That's not the one you want. I think it's called Warriors of the Chaos Waste. And that one features Wolfric and a couple of other books, but Wolfric's one of them. And it's a great book. Like, not only is Wolfric extremely well written, and he's a fantastic character. You know, if you're a fan of Norska, you will probably really appreciate Nor uh, learning Wolfric's story. Um, or a story about him, I should say. 
but it also uh, lets you read a lot of cool stuff about the Chaos Dwarfs. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about today for the bonus episode is the Chaos Dwarf Navy, uh, which did feature, I think, in the technology section, um, or maybe it was the battle and war section, but regardless, uh, I said there wasn't a lot of information on them, and I got completely corrected on that. Turns out there is a lot of information. Well, not a lot, but there's more than enough to talk about. Um, which is that the Chaos Dwarfs were actually a playable faction in the tabletop board game Man of War. Which Man of War is a long dead tabletop naval battle game that takes place in the Warhammer Fantasy universe. And I believe it was still playable until like the early 2000s I think is when it maybe it stopped getting supported. But um, there, there used to be a lot of side games by Games Workshop and it, they just stopped supporting all of them for various reasons. They got greedy and these things weren't making enough money and they stopped supporting them so then they weren't making any money and it's a whole th it's a whole thing. But uh, maybe Man of War will come back one day. In any event, the, um, the Chaos Dwarfs did have a faction. Um, there is not a lot to it. Um, all of the most, if not all of the factions in Man of War were very tiny. Um, if you were like, you had maybe four ships, somewhere between three to four, maybe a little more if you were lucky, and uh, like one special unit. Um, the lore on the ships themselves and the Chaos Dwarfs naval movements and stuff is not very dense, it's pretty straightforward and simple. Um, a lot of these things you got rules from like White Dwarf magazines essentially. Um, I, I, if I if I recall correctly, I think they literally released like the main board game, and then you could buy expansions that came with additional factions and cards, and then they would put out like supplementary rules and stuff in uh, White Dwarfs. But I did go through. Uh, I found um, a place online where I could go through all of the articles that were available. For, to my understanding, it has all the printed articles ever released about the Chaos Dwarf Navy, and it's very, very thin. Which was just a lot of the lore back then. Um, and even if the lore wasn't super thin, how much of it is like relevant to what we do now is extremely debatable. Um, but uh, I will tell you what I found. So essentially there are four ships, and we'll go over them and basically what they did. So the first ship, and probably the least impressive, was known as the Hull Destroyer. And it's a pretty amusingly simple vessel by Chaos Dwarf standards that essentially is just a massive spiked battering ram attached to a large wheel which allows the battering ram to be properly drawn back to then swing forward with a lot of impressive power added by steam to impact enemy vessels to a spectacular crushing effect. So it's a ship that did not have any range capabilities and you could just run up, run it up to your enemy and just smash them with it. Um, next, uh, the second one is known as the Thunder Roller, which was a fairly condensed ship powered that powered through the waves of the sea by using a stagger, staggeringly large spiked wheel as like a paddle, which was the titular, titular weapon of the vessel itself that it's named after, the Thunder Roller. Um, which to me just seems like the thing from Blood... It's literally just the thing from Blood Bowl, but it's a ship. Uh, the, the dwarf special weapon. Uh, I think that one's called like a Thunder... I can't remember what it's called now, but it's basically the same thing. It's just bigger. <laughs> and it made it more than capable of just crunching through enemy ships by just like ripping off big chunks of them or just pulverizing smaller ships immediately beneath the waves. Um, suspended just above the Thunder Roller's giant spiked wheel, so the Thunder Roller itself, was a sizable cannon that the Chaos Dwarfs could use to engage foes at range or to punish those attempting to flee by blasting... Uh, holes in their ships. Next is the Thunderfire Battle Barge, an impressively sized ship upon which were mounted terrifyingly large missiles known as Thunderfire Rockets. These seem to operate very similarly to Death Shrieker rockets that we see utilized by the armies of the Chaos Dwarfs found within the Darklands, but these weapons are scaled up quite a bit in size and seem to be focused entirely upon unleashing fiery devastation. 
Last and most deadly is none other than the Great Leveler Battle Barge, which carries a horrifically immense mortar that seems for all intents and purposes to be a Dreadquake mortar dialed up to 11 in both size and firepower. Woe to any within a ship or port city who must face such a nightmarish weapon. If that thing hits, I doubt you have any chance at survival. Um, the only thing that's really said about the fleets is that the Chaos Dwarf fleets were not stealthy. Um, because all of them were powered by steam and machinery rather than rowers or sails. Like, they had zero sails and, to my understanding, none of them had oars. So, they were all machine operated, mostly by steam power. But, you know, being Chaos Dwarfs, they all had these, like, huge smokestacks, essentially, in the back. Like, kind of, that kind of looked like the... The, the big towers we associate nowadays with like nuclear power plants that would just belch out this greasy black smoke. So it was really easy to know when the Chaos Dwarfs were coming from a pretty sizable distance because not only were their ships super loud because of all the machinery, but they belched out these huge clouds. So you would just see these giant, almost like storm clouds of just this disgusting, oily dirty smoke and that's how you could know where the Chaos Dwarf fleet was. Um, but I imagine since it wasn't powered by wind or people that had a fairly solid uh, rate at moving. You know, they they don't get tired as long as their machines don't break or anything, uh, which Chaos Dwarfs are pretty good at making sure that doesn't happen. So uh, they just chug along and keep coming for you. Um, so I imagine getting away from them takes uh, at least a bit of luck and careful maneuvering and careful usage of resources because if the wind dies or if for whatever reason you can't keep ahead of them just by rowing, uh, which I imagine they move impressively quick thanks to their machines, uh, if they catch up to you, you're looking at a life of enslavement or pretty quick death, uh, whichever you pick. The only other thing to note is that, like most fleets within the Man of War game, uh, the Chaos Dwarfs have like an elite flyer to join alongside their naval fleets um, that you could take, um, which makes sense in Warhammer Fantasy. You know, you would easily imagine that any fleet of notable size and power, if that faction has flyers, they would probably join alongside. You know, we see dragons and great eagles. Accompl uh, accompanying the High Elves, we see gyrocopters and, and stuff accompanying the Dwarfs, you know, uh, Greenskins have Wyverns, Bretonia have Pegasus Knights and uh, Hippogriff Riders, you know, goes on and on and on. Um, for the Chaos Dwarfs, in the Man of War game, they had Great Taurus Riders, which exactly what they sound like were warriors or sorcerers that ran around on Great Taurus. Um, but no doubt, if it was Man of War was re-released in the modern age, or you were actually battling a Chaos Dwarf fleet from a lore perspective, you there is a extremely high likelihood that you would run into a Bale Taurus or Lamassu uh, being ridden by a sorcerer. Um, I, I can't imagine in the modern lore a non-sorcerer riding a Taurus or a Lamassu. Um, like it the to my understanding, the uh, the Chaos Dwarfs have to use magic to even ride a Taurus because the flames on the creature are so intense. So I can't see like a Thane or a Lord um, riding one, nor could I see them riding a Lamassu, which have to make specific packs and are also sorcerous beasts that seem to prefer having sorcerer prophets for riders. But um, that's going to be it. Everything else that I... I kind of went through all the videos and kind of just read through like the top 20 or 30 comments on all of them to look for anything that I found like super pertinent to talk about. Um, like I said, there are other details you can find there. Eric the Red left a lot of really cool and insightful comments uh, about Chaos Dwarf design. Uh, especially, uh, well, mostly about older designs. Um, so for the purposes of me following the lore of what I consider like the timeline and the reality or setting that I'm focusing on, I don't consider a lot of stuff that was brought up in those comments to be important. Um, if you'd, but I would highly recommend checking them out because there is some really cool stuff uh, to see there. Um, but that's going to be it for me. 
Um, the last thing I need to do on this video, and it will also be included in the top comment and in the title, is that uh, I am ready to announce when I will be doing the a Chaos Dwarf live stream, where I will be streaming on Twitch to just talk about Chaos Dwarfs. And once we're done with that, we're done with Chaos Dwarfs. We're not talking about them again until uh, there's like an announcement on them or something. But... Uh, that is going to be taking place on Wednesday, which is the 28th of August at noon Central Standard Time. So it's kind of like right smack in the middle of the day. Um, hopefully that's a good enough time that people can tune in or jump in and stuff. And basically I'm going to be talking about Chaos Dwarfs uh, and trying to answer any questions that people felt were not answered um i have a vaguely bad feeling it's probably gonna be a lot of people asking questions that we have already answered in which case i'll be trying to direct people uh, as opposed to just re-answering them over and over but don't worry if you can't make it to the live stream for some reason uh i will be uploading the live stream here on this channel as the final episode of the Q chaos dwarf q a playlist which has all the episodes in order. We'll have this episode, of course, and then we'll have the finale live stream. So uh, I would love to see you guys all come by and uh, ask any questions or just chat about Chaos Dwarfs. Um, if there's anything else pertinent about the faction that comes up, I will you know, deal with that as is appropriate. But until then, I wanna thank you all so much for uh, joining me for this series. I'll give my actual closing thoughts on it in the, the Q&A stream, but until then, uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys then.